Today's event is organized by the PIC in association with Symbiosis International University and with the support of publishers, West Press, to release a book contributed by outstanding women journalists. Like Chameli Devi Jain, a single housewife who joined the freedom struggle in Delhi, these women too exemplify the values of independence, courage, and dedication. The book covers a range of topical issues, human interest views, child labor, atrocities against women, political corruption, environmental concerns, financial scams, wars, cyclones, past massacres, insurgency, and much, much else. We have here 40 stories that look back on writers' journalistic journey and reflect their views on journalism. I will now request Mr. Ketkar, Sevanthi Naiman, Vinita Deshmu, and Mr. Hedrugan to please come to what this serves as a diocese now. Gujarat is very important, but then I'd like to flag up Gujarat is actually one of the most uh, 
important journalistic reports on Gujarat, I believe, was the Editor's Guild report. And that my chapter in this book uh, deliberately concentrates on that because I believe it's a report that has been consciously erased by the media from its own mind. And for me, that is a very interesting study that this year in the Editor's Guild, which is a body of journalists, editors of India, they decided, they have periodically uh, done investigations, brought out analysis, and it's a very prestigious body if you look at the reports that the editor's field has brought out. I have a copy here, it's called Rights and Wrongs. That's the title of the report in the chat. Uh, without going into the details of what that report contains, i just like to uh, mention that why, or ask the question aloud of my colleagues and the audience, why has the media chosen to forget this report? and not use it as a benchmark for itself. Sometimes I feel it's because of the fear. And I say this with responsibility because I believe that some of the finest work in Gujarat in the first three months was done by journalists. On the ground, print and television. Without fear, they were attacked and yet they did their coverage and that's why the story got out to the world, to the country, to all of us. They were threatened. Each one of them was threatened. So if the, uh, the issue we need to raise is and it's an issue that I remember Women and Media Committee was formed by some of our seniors, Kalpuna, Amun, Sivanti and others, and some of us followed up, Gita, Seshu, Meena, myself. I think we don't have time for reflection. I think media is not allowing itself to reflect, analyze, and absorb criticism. And I think that space we need to fill. We need to fill. I think this uh, has brought uh, the topic rightly for uh, Shevanti to address because Shevanti has been following the media internally and externally and the media critic as well as media analysis has the so-called liberalization and corporatization of the media affected the content and the subject choice of subjects in the media also apart from whatever you want to say. Post liberalization the media has changed because uh, let's say the subfront, the reader has also changed, or they presume the reader has changed. And that has led to a situation today where you watch so much uh, on TV, you watch so much chat, because frankly nobody is going out and doing any news gathering. The cheapest programming you can do is to have all those discussions on television. Newspapers today, cutting down on budgets, cutting down desperately on staff. I mean, there's a lot of layoffs going on in the country at this point. And that's happening because, again, they don't find it viable. Uh, and you can rest assured that when they cut down on staff, they are cutting down on covering all those people who need to be covered in various corners of this country. So that is, so that's an issue. The audience may change, but the audience, the people of the country haven't changed. Their situation hasn't changed. And you still need to tell your audience, of, uh, and to the extent that your audience includes policymakers, politicians, and everybody, you still need to have them keep in, uh, keep in mind for them uh, the, the small Indian, the poor Indian, the people all across the states, and all of that. <coughs> Just to give you the background of what uh, Shivanti said, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, in newspaper, the maximum cost is that of a newspaper. Almost 70% of the cost is in newspaper. So I think Vidita will tell you how the newspapers are touring our No, more than that, I'd like to say that we should not look at the newspaper just as a consumer or a product. I mean, the uh, chief heart and soul of journalism is citizen empowerment. So whether you get subsidies or not, the main point is of relevant reporting, that which directly affects the citizens. But the more, main principle of journalism is that we have to adhere to the primary leadership which is the reader and not secondary readership that is commerce, that is different. However, even within this uh, you know, prism, you can achieve relevant reporting and that is simply not done. It is a one-way traffic based on the commerce. So I think that in today's journalism, despite let's say even having the tendency of pampering the uh, commercial guys who are become of monsters and the real citizens and genuine people have become 
like insects to be trampled upon, even then we can um, practice relevant journalism. But it is the duty of a journalist to put before the public, you know, uh, by tradition in journalism we generally take quotes uh, from two sides. You know, you have to take the official quote. But I must tell you that in Dow Chemical's case and President of India, I did not have to take an official quote because it was all there in black and white from the office. And I just think that uh, journalism today should not be practiced without uh, using RPI. So I really think that despite I understand that it's very difficult for newspapers to survive, I feel that relevant journalism will put it up in a very superior bracket and all citizens would be very thankful that it is a citizen's paper and not a consumer's paper. It should not be. And I feel that the conduct of how journalists behave within the profession has also got to do with how much they are being paid today. But today we've reached a stage by which I think journalists are earning far too much. <laughs> far too much. No, I think it affects the way you look at the world. It affects the fact that you're not able to critique anymore because you already consider yourself part of an establishment. So I think somewhere we also need to look at the fact that the way salaries are getting structured are making journalists too comfortable. And I think that means that they don't have the ability to distance themselves from the establishment and critique the establishment. I just want to add about this uh, salary, you know. I mean, I really don't think that if you're poor, you become, you're very enlightened or something. If you're poorly paid. <coughs> you know, I mean, a heart surgeon, he charges a lot and for his expertise. The basic thing is that the heart of journalism should be where it is. The principles, integrity of journalism should be where it is. And if, along with other industries, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, in other fields, if journalists are getting good salaries, I don't think it is a crime. The average salary for a correspondent who is not in a metro, who is not in an English newspaper, so the, uh, something like the NH Journal, which today happens to be the largest in the country, pays an average of 12,000 people. You know, with the combination of media, where you have all kinds, you have websites, Twitter, everything. It takes very little to break a story. I mean, it can be a small thing like yours or a much smaller thing like mine. If you've broken a story, everybody picks it up, unless they have a reason to not. Well, actually, the stories uh, are covered when they're broken. But let me add a caveat to your argument that uh, once you get the idea in black and white, you need not take the other side. I think that is not absolutely journalistically correct because the RTI question defines the RTI answer. So it is all the way more necessary that even if you have an RTI answer, you can ask the party concerned that I have this RTI document with me, which you cannot challenge, it has come from your own department, but now what is your position on the following questions? Or else I am going for another RTI application. Yeah, no, the point my... So not to get the other side, I think is not good journalism. You know, I feel a little uncomfortable with debates on the media. And today's debate for me, is symptomatic of that lack of strong research in three ways. First is the manner in which one speaks the media in generic terms. The media is as diverse, as pluralistic as our political life. So to blame media for not doing this or doing that systematically, I think is incorrect. Secondly, there are paradoxes. Those very media, largely the concern is with English language newspapers. So, observation number one, please let's not talk in generic terms. One of the things that Tisa would agree is that these English language papers, much revived, most of them, on the issue of secularism, have not compromised on principles. This is, this is one thing. You know, to look at it as if it is capitalist, non-capitalist, market-oriented, consumerist, elitist. I think we need to be a little more nuanced in our procedure. And finally, on the question of RTI, right, I completely agree that frivolous RTI applications have been made, are being made, etc. But RTI is only one way of getting hold of facts. But mind you, facts themselves can be concocted 
facts themselves can be maneuvered, manipulated. And we know that this is the case. So what you're doing is, but within that context, where sports, entertainment, etc., and now increasingly, I mean, I once had a three murti which, which got me into trouble with my bosses, saying that the, the presiding trinity in media is sex and sex and spirituality. Alright, it is, it is a mix of these three that seems to, to sell. And yet, even in these papers, you've got enough space for doing the kind of journalism that you, you ought to be doing. And I think certainly for the past two and a half, three years, I've been noticing major newspapers are devoting more and more space to issues that even five years ago would have been relegated to the background or not covered at all. Thank you so much uh, to the uh, panelists once again and thanks to all of those who were involved in making this happen. Thank you so very much.